Hey everyone, my name is Noah. I'm from Ontario Zone 6A. Today I want to show you a little bit about what I've got growing on. We're in the about the end of uh, winter. We're slowly approaching the beginning of spring. This is the best time to start seeds of any kind, you know. You're, you're looking for, uh, you know, pepper starts and tomato starts and all that good stuff. Right now is the best time to start instead of going to the supermarket or wherever, you know, your local nursery or garden store and buying something from uh, already grown, maybe uh, $5 and up. Sometimes they're cheap, sometimes they're not. Uh, in saying that, you can do it for fractions of the cost or for free depending on uh, your setup. You know, when you start off, things are gonna be typically a little more expensive, but as you progress, when you start saving seeds, doing your own composting, and, and you know, becoming a little more resourceful in that way, um, you know, you'll save tons. I also like to grow things like uh, more on the, the rare side. So rare plants, uh, specifically ones that are fruits or that have fruits. So um, I'm a big fan of ethnobotany, which are plants that have a particular use. And um, my, my passion in that lies around ones that are also Typically ornamental, but that doesn't have to be a, a defining feature. I really, really like it when uh, you can find a plant that has a, a bit of a niche use and it, it's kind of, uh, you know, outside the box. That Those always really excite me. So let's dive in. Okay, to start off, this is my uh, little desert area. Over here, these are actually jungle cacti, so uh, they can handle more water than a desert cactus. Um, in particular, these are, if I'm not mistaken, this is a Christmas cactus. This is a Thanksgiving cactus. This one I propagated from three leaves that I pulled off of uh, my mom's plant. And I, I brought them home and stuck them in some soil. And this is what they look like when they start to grow. They have that nice little color, that nice little red. You actually get a variegated form, if I'm not mistaken, and also a, I'm not sure if it's a variegation or like an aurea uh, type deal, but basically the whole pigment of the the plant is more of this color. And so the, the bigger leaves will mature out into this color, which is real nice, or there's a variegated form where it's actually like a cream color on the green, which is which is pretty cool. Over here, we've got a Ampuntia. This is an Ampuntia. Uh, I don't know the uh, species exactly, but this is a uh, Ampuntia uh, variegata of some kind. And then we've got an elephant's foot right here. Um, then we come down here. We've got some lithops and some Pyote cacti. The special one right here is actually a variegated Pyote cactus which is uh, pretty uncommon. They're typically, uh, they're pretty expensive for plants in my opinion. And this I got for free from uh, a fellow plant collector. I told him that I have a keen interest in variegated plants. And uh, he just, he said, I don't know if it's variegated or not, but you're more than welcome to it. So I, I took it uh, while well, I also had bought, I think um, three or four of these three or four uh, Pyote cacti, but I gave those away to friends. We'll back it up a bit. We come over into the tent. Um, just so you guys know, the the tent is usually closed. It's slightly ajar with a, a crack probably about this big, allowing uh, this area to get a sufficient amount of light. Um, when you come into here, this is a, a pineapple guava also called a, I think it's ACCA uh, Swellowana or something like that. Um, I'm not really good at the pronunciation of the Latin names. I mostly butcher them, but uh, I'll, I'll just use the common names. This is a variegated yellow flower angel trumpet. It's actually really, really nice when the flowers come out. They just, they hang down, they're probably about they're bigger than the leaves. They're quite spectacular. The thing with these are, um, you, you don't want them to uh, be in like your bedroom or places like that. If I'm not mistaken, this is a plant you derive the, the drug Brandonga from, which is like a, 
It's like a dissociative drug where you, you can literally like control people's mind with it. Uh, and then for the rest of the person's life, they have like memory shortages and all sorts of different things. And people also try to use it as a drug uh, because it's so poisonous. But the, the other issue with that is um, the, the type of hallucination, quote unquote, that you would, you would be inducing is uh, a state of being poisoned. And that state, um, you, you're delirious, you're seeing like um, demons and monsters and all sorts of really hor horrific things. So uh, I highly advise do not ingest or uh, take any plant material that you're not familiar with. Do your research. And even if you've done scrupulous research, I highly advise against ingesting poisonous plants, especially ones with a track record like this one. So it'll come up here. This is an Anona reticulata. Um, I actually really like saying the name of this one in particular. Once again, don't know if I'm saying it correctly, but it's a uh, red custard apple. I believe I still have the name right here, which is pretty awesome. I got this for a steal at Colasantes in Kingsville, Ontario. Um, it was at the end of the season. They're clearing out all their plants, and this is one of the tropical ones that were left. And ironically, this is one of the ones that I tried ordering in the spring, and they told me they didn't have uh, it available. But I went to Colasantes, and uh, it was at the back of the greenhouse, kind of tucked away for half off or something like that. So not only was it a score, but I was over the moon. <laughs> and still am, honestly. I'll creep in here, angle my mister so I'm not making my leg wet. Okay, and I'll show you guys something cool right now. When you're spraying plants, you wanna spray them from the bottom first to get any of them baddies off or any bugs, any of them bibbits, and then you hit the top and I'll wash them all off. And it's like a, uh, a physical form of pest management. Uh, pests like spider mites and uh, other certain other pests, they don't like a uh, particular, particularly um, moist environment with high humidity. So alternatively, you could have a higher humidity around uh, 70, 80%. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, you will never get spider mites in that level of humidity. Although you'll start to come into other problems, like if you don't have proper air circulation and you have a stagnant room, that'll lead to issues like powdery mildew, mold, and um, just varying degrees of um, your plants losing their, their vigor and their health because uh, plants, they like that, the movement of air. Not all plants, some plants, most plants. So moving on, we've got a Barbados cherry with a, uh, <laughs> this is called uh, Spanish moss, I believe, I think. Uh, it's common in like Louisiana in the south. And then right here, I've got a air plant. They're both in the air plant species, but I, th I find it looks quite stunning hanging in the, hanging off the wood of the, the Barbados cherry. So that's what this is. I think they also call it Acreola or something like that. I, I could be absolutely mistaken. But um, pr pretty cool plant there. It's super vigorous. You can just chop this thing back and it'll just keep growing and growing and growing. I had it to, to next to nothing. I, uh, I let it dry right out. I honestly, I just forgot about it. Uh, had a lot of stuff going on, you know, personal stuff. And then I came back and gave it a good water and it started growing like crazy. Uh, I don't know how to get the, the leaves super dark. I think it just happens over time. I may be uh, not feeding it enough because it could be a heavy feeder. Uh, I, although I, I believe it is a very heavy feeder. I've given it tons and tons of uh, nutrients and it's, it's loving it. I'll step out just a bit. Come over here. This is a lemon guava. This is actually a really special plant to me. It was given to me by my friend Mario. Um, not the best at caring for it. I've, I've cut it back, you know, I'm trying to keep it in here. It's quite a large specimen. So if I were to, to have it in its uh, full glory, it would, it would have taken up the whole uh, tent. There's also on it all sorts. These are the precursors to the fruit. They're the, the flowers. 
So what happens is this opens up into a very showy white flower with a bunch of nice, I think they're called pistols or petioles. And uh, it, it's almost reminiscent of a mimosa flower or a caper flower, or if you're fit, familiar with that. Um, so that, that's pretty spectacular. And then on top of that, they smell amazing. Absolutely wonderful. It's almost like citrus uh, with the, how perfumey it is but it doesn't have the same smell. It's its own, it's, its own fragrance. And it's very alluring, in, in my opinion, at least. We'll come down here. So right in the middle there, that's a Panache Tiger Fig. It's slowly coming out of dormancy now. I had it dormant all winter, and I brought it up here because I want to get a bit of a head start. Hopefully I can, uh, because I said, this is a long, I don't know if I, I mentioned this. This is a long season fig. It uh, generally grows in about zone eight or higher. So that's, if I'm not mistaken, around 200 days of growing. Um, whereas in my zone, we have about 120 days of growing in our season. So just not quite long enough. But it's beautiful. Those figs are uh, variegated. So when the fruit comes out, they have all these uh, white and green uh, stripes all along them, hence the name uh, Panache Tiger. And also, when it ripens, it ripens to a yellow fig. And it still has the stripes on it when it's ripe, if I'm not mistaken. Unlike the Jolly Tiger, which has uh, variegated foliage and variegated figs, but it ripens to uh, a red color, and that red color um, mutes out all of the, the variegation, which is uh, pretty interesting. Also, it's not a stable uh, form of variegation. Speaking about variegated plants, I got two pretty common, uh, rare house plants. This is the Hindu rope hoya, and this is the pink princess, Philodendron. I don't know if it's appropriate to call it the Hindu rope hoya. Personally, I don't find anything offensive in saying that. I'm not Hindu, but uh, it's to me, it doesn't sound like an offensive term. You know, like you're not you're not using it in a derogatory manner so i can't see personally how that would be offensive but if i'm wrong please correct me but i wanted to point out which is really freaking cool about this it inverted so it's usually variegated on the outside as you can see and all of a sudden it pushed out a leaf where half of it's variegated on the inside so if that continues to go the way that i hope it goes I'll have two forms on one plant, which will be pretty interesting, pretty unique. I think they call that like the Maui something or other. And then also I'd like to mention that there's these variegated section or sorry, uh, albino sections, which is pretty neat. It's just pushing out straight albino. And those wouldn't be able to uh, survive on their own. But because it's uh, there's also green foliage before the uh, albino, it actually supports the albino and you can have these plants, the, the leaves stay on, I wouldn't say indefinitely, some variegation in some albinos, the, the sun or even age, varying other factors will, uh, will damage the leaf a lot quicker than say something with chlorophyll. But, let's see, we can see the pink on here. A little bit of pink, a little bit of pink. Mine was really nice. I had very nice variegation when I got it, as you can see. But what happened was uh, I had it downstairs, not in full light. And I found out that they really like bright light. They do well and it, it helps keep their leaves small. Uh, their leaves are very, very um, thick when they grow in this kind of light. Whereas over here, they're not, they, these ones aren't quite as thick. They don't feel as robust. And then on top of that, the color darkens and they also start to become more variegated. Whereas if you look at some of these other leaves, the variegation almost stops completely. So a little tip, variegated plants typically, they, they need more light, but they don't like the intensity, if that makes sense. So you can easily burn the white parts of variegated plants because your your light's too hot or too intense, but they need that that extra light so that they can properly photosynthesize because they have a deficit of chlorophyll, 
which makes it so that they're not able to produce as much sugars and feed themselves as if they were able to if they had, let's say, pure green leaves. In the corner, we've got a ZZ plant. I don't know the Latin name for that. Sorry about that. This is a sugarloaf pineapple from Hawaii. It's not actually from Hawaii. I just believe that's where they originated from. And then we'll come over here. I've got two orchid cacti and then two orchids. I did some fun little uh, pot thing there. I don't know, arrangement, and I wouldn't even call that an arrangement. I just put uh, two of them in the same pot and then I put some iron pyrite in there to give it a kind of a, a nice, interesting appearance. Also, if you wonder what these are, they're sticky traps for uh, thrips and flying bugs. A tip for thrips is, especially when you're growing tropical plants, um, you don't necessarily want your plant to dry out 100% completely. Certain plants like citrus will benefit from drying out, but other plants like, for instance, um, you know, uh, a pineapple guava, you in the uh, regular guava, even a uh, Chilean guava, you don't want those to dry out completely. It, they drop all of their leaves, they die right back, and they have a hard time surviving that. So, personally, I would stay away from, you know, uh, underwatering your guava, overwatering your citrus. It's all it's all le a learning experience, right? Like if you haven't killed a couple plants, you're not a gardener. That's just <laughs> that's just plain and simple. So we'll move over here. Um, actually, I'll go down here first. This is a uh, elderberry, an American elderberry. I took a cutting from outside midwinter. I seen a, a section of it dying back and it was, it looked like it kept progressing. So I thought it was fungal. So I cut a huge portion off of that section and I had a little bit left. So I stuck it in some soil and it's propagated no problem. That's gonna, that's gonna come out and become its own branch eventually. And then off that branch, there'll be more branches and so on and so forth. And in these two pots, I have Caucasian capers, which is an endangered species of caper. And I have, if I am not mistaken, uh, Halsey or Holy Basil. It's an adaptogen that uh, allegedly is, it's really good to incorporate in your diet. And it's uh, very much so like a, uh, like regular basil or seasoning. So it, it's not very difficult to incorporate. This beautiful plant is a spectacular plant. It's called Apios Americana. And it's the American ground nut, I believe is what it's called. It produces a tuber in the soil. And the, the tuber, they're like, uh, it's like a rosary, right? They've got like tubers from this size all the way up to the size of your palm, even bigger. And basically, uh, they're all connected by like this really thin root, but they're apparently very, very delicious. And then on top of that, they're perennial. And then they also produce a bean, which is edible. You can eat the bean in its green phase. And when it starts to, the pod matures and it becomes um, like woody and the beans are hard, you can actually use those for soup, if I'm not mistaken, uh, or much like a regular, uh, any kind of bean. But in saying that, uh, these plants are pretty uncommon, if I'm not mistaken. They're a permaculture plant, so they're really good for continual food crops, for managing certain areas. They're well adapted in the Canadian environment, so they're very capable of keeping back certain other species, like other invasive species, and out-competing them. Um, part of the reason why I got that, I'm going to train it along uh, fences, and hopefully I'll have some videos about that. We'll come up here. Our uh, humidity and our heat is a little bit on the high side. Ideally, I'd like the heat to be at about 70, maybe 72 degrees. So we're about, um, you know, five, five, maybe six degrees, a little bit too high. And on top of that, our humidity. Humidity ideally should be anywhere. You don't want it to be below 50%, though uh, many plants will grow and do just fine. Uh, Plants in particular that do well with very low humidity are, are desert uh, dwelling plants. Um, but even even um, orchid, orchid cacti, 
there's a lot of plants that'll do well with with the lower humidity but in saying that the higher the humidity the easier it is for plants to grow the easier it is for them to breathe and do exactly what it is that plants do best so just keep that in mind you know anything it says wet i would say anything above 70 75 is getting pretty high on the humidity certain plants like vanilla and certain aeroids uh, like philly, certain philodendrons, they'll require a very, very high humidity level, like in the 90, 90 to 100% humidity, which is absolutely crazy. But that's not necessarily quite bizarre because it's pretty prevalent in nature to have that level of humidity, especially at certain times of the year. Um, so yeah, I'll come over on this far side. You see these little guys starting. Those are... Aunt Molly's ground cherry, which is like a, it's in the tomato family or a husk tomato. It has a little uh, orangish yellow berry and they're very sweet, reminiscent of uh, pineapple or uh, to me, I, I find that they taste very like <laughs> mixed berry -y. I know that's kind of a horrible description, but it's like if you took a strawberry and mixed it with like uh, pineapple and then a little bit of tomato in there they're absolutely outstanding super delicious and they store for quite a bit you pick the your plants clean and then you you bring all the pods inside of a bowl and as the outside of the the husk uh, turns papery you peel it open and eat the berry on the inside super delicious and then here I've got 10 uh, Amish paste tomatoes absolutely one of the best tomato varieties I found We'll come over here. These four in the front are peppers, peach sugar rush to be exact, which allegedly is a very great pepper for uh, eating fresh sauces. It's a very sweet, fruity pepper. That's also like around the habanero range for spiciness. Let me come over here. Hard to see, but this is a canna lily from seed. I've got burgundy canna lilies and they have red flowers. So I collected a bunch of seeds in the in the fall and I, I, I probably have like five or six in there. There's only one of them that sprouted. Ironically, the one in the middle, which is kind of cool. Um, so yeah, I'm growing this from seed. The cool thing about canna lilies are they're also a food crop. So you can eat them, you can eat the stems. Uh, I would look into how to eat canna lilies specifically because i don't want to tell you anything you know that's going to make anybody sick but uh one of my friends told me uh i'm a, I'm a gardening manager so i i do uh like and supervisor also so i do a lot of uh gardening projects and while we were gardening one of my uh co-workers told me that those are perfectly edible uh, every year their family when they're close to the end, they chop them down and they eat they eat the stock like a sugar cane. And I thought that was just one of the coolest things. I come over here. There's silver mountain mint. Personally, that looks like an oddball, like a, a seed that doesn't belong because the mountain mint, if you can see, it has the the more round leaves. I could have also mixed this up. This could be the holy basil, but I believe it's the mountain mint, if I'm not mistaken. And along here, I've got uh, alliums. These alliums are in order. Uh, blue solis, I believe, uh, like leeks. So it's a perpetual leek. If you don't separate them, you grow them in a clump, they'll actually become perennialized and they'll they'll divide amongst the, the root ball. Um, well, I guess they'll they'll divide yeah they'll divide by root division uh, in a clumping style. So you basically the proper way to harvest any leek, you typically would go above ground and you pluck it. You don't pull it out by the root because then you don't get the plant anymore. You go to the base of it and you cut it. Same with uh, your anything that you don't eat the ball above. So like the Welsh onions, bunching onions, anything like that. Cut it at the bottom. Don't rip out your whole plant unless you want to eat that little bit of white root with it. Nothing wrong with that. That's cool too. But in saying that, you want the most out of your plants. That's probably the best way to do it. So I also, I have shallots here, if I'm not mistaken. Zebrun shallots. 
uh, white soulless or blue soulless uh, leek, sorry, red Welsh onions, white Welsh onions, and then along this row, I've got cannabis. Pretty fun stuff. Um, I hope you enjoyed the video and I wish you all the best. Take care.